I'd like to reconvene our meeting. And so we're moving on to the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the agenda as presented, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. On to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items A through F as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the consent agenda items A through F as presented say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. On to presentations. The budget. All right, good evening everyone. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, our first of three budget presentations or workshops that discusses the 24-25 budget year. Um, one of the first things you'll notice is we've got um, quite an agenda ahead of us because there's uh, several talking points, especially the first four to five bulleted items talk about the state budget um, and the governor's proposal talks about foundation aid. And that's gonna kind of help craft the narrative of our foundation aid for the 24-25 school year that the governor has proposed. Um, we're gonna highlight how we use our reserves as a source of revenue uh, year over year, and also talk about our capital and bus purchase reserves, how we use those reserves. Um, and finally, based on that information, we're gonna craft some budget goals for the 24-25 school year. We'll take a look at our tax levy calculation and our historical uh, tax levy history of where we've been in, in regards to the tax levy. Um, talk about some purchases that we need to make to update our bus fleet, and then finally visit the ballot propositions in a very broad manner and talk about next steps after today, between today and the next uh, pre budget presentation in March. So Mr. Ganster. Okay, so I'm gonna start with kind of the big picture at the state level and then uh, Carl's gonna bring it home with the rest of the presentation. So I'm gonna start with the last bullet point here. So the Division of Budget at New York State is actually proposing a $4.3 billion deficit when it comes to this year's budget. So our state government is going to be looking to close a $4.3 billion gap in the budget. So as the state goes, so does the school system. So what that means is, is there's going to be many districts across the state, and Carl's gonna to get to this, who are going to have some fairly significant budget gaps to deal with. Um, our governor is talking about that this budget does propose more foundation aid or school aid than ever before, which is factually true. But there's a huge caveat to that. So if you look up here, it says an increase of $825 million from last year. That's true, but 100 million of that is already earmarked to go towards additional pre-K um, funding statewide. So really we're talking about a $725 million increase. Now, obviously $725 million is a lot of money, but when you start dividing that money up across the state, specifically taking into account a three to 4% raise for educators statewide. So think about every single educational employee across the state receiving a three to 4% raise this year, plus increases in the cost of health insurance. That $725 million doesn't even cover those year to year raises, okay? So when we think about inflation, um, Yes, it's a lot of money and it's more than ever before, but the increase doesn't keep pace with fixed costs that districts have. So yes, it's more, but think about it like it's a gap in and of itself. So I, you know, that sets the tone for us uh, with this budget presentation, and I'm gonna let Carl take it from here. Thank you, sir. Uh, so like Mr. Ganser was saying, in November, one of the projections from the Association of School Business Officials said um, year over year, they were anticipating based on CPI and based on various formulas that go into the foundation aid formula, 
they were anticipating the increase to be closer to 1.2 billion. So when 825 million came about, it actually, you know, it said it's almost down 400 million from, from our November projections or calculations. One of the things I included in this presentation is a link to um, a mid-year financial update from the Association of School Business Officials. Um, this budget presentation is going to be posted on the district webpage um, tomorrow. Todd Clausen is posting it tomorrow, and anybody who's uh, listening in tonight can access this presentation and go to this link. This link essentially is a three to, well, if you include the front cover, it's four pages. So it's, it's a relatively easy read um, of three pages. Well, you know, I take that back. There's some dense information because it's regarding the division of budget, but it's written by the Association of School Business Officials who constantly work with the division of budget. And one of the things I wanted to highlight on the very first page of literature is the budget shortfall or the budget gap that they're anticipating, not just for the fiscal year 2025, but for the fiscal years 2026 and fiscal year 2027. And I want that to really stand out because the, the division of budget is projecting nearly a 13 or, well, depending on if you do a mid-year update or an enacted budget, but even if you do a mid-year update, mid-year update currently is a $4.3 billion deficit. The following year, $9.5 billion. The following year, nearly $7.7 .7 billion. Those are some significant budget shortfalls that are being anticipated. Going back to the presentation, we talk about, we talk, when we look into the why, one of the things that's been highlighted is the weakening economy. Um, there's been some massive layoffs across the state with large companies. As a result, when you look at that weakening economy, what also suffers is a reduction in state tax receipts, specifically income tax. Uh, when you have income tax, when you have enough folks on unemployment, there's also, um, lesser spending year over year. Um, finally, the state over the last two to three years, just like many school districts did, the state also built in some new programs and some additional funding as a result of the pandemic. Now the state is looking to continue those programs and that is creating a further strain on the state budget year over year because they're trying to carry over those programs that were started during the pandemic into the future years. So this map I think is a good, good snapshot of what the governor has proposed across New York State. Um, in mid-January, the governor's proposal came out, and this map shows you, if you look at just um, broadly, any school districts in yellow, orange, or red, I'll say that again, any regions in that state map that represent school districts in yellow, orange, or red are, based on the governor's proposal, getting lesser foundation aid than they received last year. That's unprecedented. Because for, for many, many decades in New York State, there has been a handshake agreement called the Save Harmless Agreement that says you cannot get lesser foundation or state aid than you received the previous year. So the governor, in order to close this budget gap, is essentially rewriting the rule book. And there are several reasons why. As you look across New York State and you look at some of those regions as well, um, one of the things that's been uh, well published is declining enrollment across the state. People leaving New York State and moving to other states. And so what the governor is saying is, I'm actually giving you your full share of foundation aid. I'm just calculating it per pupil. And so you look at several districts across the state that have had declining enrollment for the last two, three, four, or more years. Now those districts are seeing major deficits in foundation aid to the tune of, you know, 10%, 20%. Some districts in our region, there are some of our contiguous districts, our neighbors are seeing million dollar uh, deficits year over year. And, for, and that has the potential to cripple those districts. So it's some very stark news that the governor has proposed and it's got many people um, very alarmed. It's got some advocacy groups, whether it's the school boards association or the superintendents association or the association of school business officials advocating in Albany to try to restore some of this funding. But the challenge is there's a budget gap. And so, the, you know, there has to be some give and take and they have to find a way to, to come up with this money by cutting some other programs as well, possibly. So in regards to Phelps, Clifton Springs, what does that mean for us? Um, just to put it plainly, we were one of the districts on, on, on the previous slide that was, in the, that was in the green. 
So to give you just a quick history, so I'm going to use the mouse to just kind of hover over some numbers. The foundation aid formula back in 2021-22 said that Phelps Clifton Springs was, was due in foundation aid 17.5 million. But Phelps Clifton Springs actually received 14.7 million. Why? Because Phelps, this district was never fully funded based on the foundation aid formula. It was what's called one of the historically underfunded school districts. During that year, for the next few years, once again, as a result of the federal funds, as a result of stimulus funds for the state and school districts, the state said, over the next two years, we're going to give you 50% catch-up aid, 50% the following year and 50% the year after that. So in 22-23, they said, based on, the f based on the formula that we never followed, here's 50% of your allotment, 16.155 million. We received $50,000 less, but once again, that increase in foundation aid was, well, was welcomed. The following year, they said, here comes your other 50% based on the formula. Now, notice this number of $17.5 million in 23-24. That actual number is the number back from 21-22, so that number is two years old. So once again, we were thrilled to anticipate $17.5 million. Instead, we received $19.5 million because the state said we're giving you some catch-up money because that number once again is two years old we're also going to factor in cpi or the consumer price index which at that point was somewhere in the vicinity of eight to ten percent so a historically underfunded school district like phelps clifton springs received quite a bit of foundation aid and once again we used that money to do a couple things we hit the reset button on our reserves on how much we used of our reserves as a source of revenue the second thing we did was we built in the positions, the folks that we hired through federal funds, we built those positions in a year in advance because we also knew we were going to go into a time of uncertainty, of not knowing what the state budget looks like. And here we are, and while we have some of our neighbors suffering, we're one of the few districts that's actually getting an increase in foundation aid to the tune of $1.18 million. The last thing I'd like to answer is, why, is it ha why are other districts getting lesser? Why are we getting more? Um, as I dove into this and I worked with Questar 3 BOCES, I want to give our experts at uh, Questar 3 um, BOCES, they're in downstate New York, they're the financial experts that work with the Department of Budget. They ran the numbers for us and they said one of the things, one of the metrics for this district that has changed year over year is what's called an extraordinary needs count or an EN count of students. Those are students that are newly classified in special education or those are students that are newly classified English language learners. That count of students has increased by 19 students year over year, which gets factored into another part of the formula called PNI or Pupils Needs Index, which drives our foundation aid. So hence we're seeing an increase in foundation aid per pupil because of those metrics. So once again, that's something that's not, it's not deliberate. We didn't deliberately create it. This has happened to us, but we are one of the fortunate districts to receive more foundation aid year over year based on the governor's proposal. This proposal still has to be negotiated over the next few months between the legislature and the assembly. So there's going to be a lot of give and take over the next few months. Here's something we've heard from Albany that they've made very clear. They're not going to pass an on-time budget. April 1st is the day after <coughs> Easter, and they have no intentions of passing an on-time budget, especially with this kind of deficit. They also have meetings scheduled well into mid-April, which means that they're going to be there's a high likelihood that the state budget may be passed mid-April, right around the same time that school districts are required by law to, to finalize their school budgets. So you're going to see some school districts, have, uh, some boards, having to adopt a school budget without actually knowing the real dollar amount of where things get settled on in April. So I think we had to do that last year, if I'm not mistaken as well. We're going to be in a similar position this year. At least that's what we're hearing once again from Albany. Uh, before we move on, could you just remind the board why or how the state was able to enact catch-up aid for traditionally underfunded school districts and why all of a the sudden they're not able to keep pace? Federal funding. It's, it's, the, it's the stimulus aid, it's the foundation aid, because not only did school districts receive that aid, but the states also received a significant amount of aid as a result of the pandemic. And so the state budget was essentially... I, I don't want to use the word flush with cash, but they had enough money to go around where they could finally give historically underfunded school districts their, their full, uh, full aid. Um, 
thank you. Yeah, great point, though. So while we have $1.18 million, um, an increase of $1.18 million based on the governor's proposal, here are some budgetary stressors. Here are some things that are going to put, put a stress on the budget. <coughs> if we take our full-time enrollment uh, of teachers, if I, if we, I'm sorry, if we take all our staff, our full-time staff, based on our co uh, collective bargaining agreements and our contractual raises that Mr. Ganster had referenced, ours are somewhere in the vicinity of 3.75%, give or take, based on different negotiating units. If we take a 3.75 increase in salary for our full-time staff, that amount is about 630000 year over year. Health care rates, uh, the Finger Lakes Area School Health Plan has just released, they, they haven't given too much detail, but they've just released their percentage increase mm -hmm. for the high deductible plan year over year. That's somewhere in the vicinity of another 9.5%, which could easily be a couple hundred thousand dollars. The last thing that we've noticed is our BOCES programs have reached out to us, whether that be in special education or occupational education like the Finger Lakes Area Technical Career Center. Um, yeah. Their increases are somewhere in the vicinity of 5 to 6 percent. Now, when you look at um, a student that attends the Technical Career Center where they're charging us roughly about $10,600 per student, when they increase that number by about 5 to 6 percent or a $500 increase, per child. When, you've, when we've got 94 students going there, that's, that increase is about fifty-five dollars to $60,000, just the increase. So those are some things that are going to put a strain on our budget. So once again, we are incredibly fortunate to be receiving, at least based on the governor's proposal, $1.18 million. But a healthy portion of that is going to go in salaries, benefits, and some of our BOCES programming for our students. So using our reserves as a source of revenue. A few minutes ago, I talked about this board, um, based, on, based on our recommendation, hitting the reset button. If you look over the last five years, our use of reserves was increasing year over year. Um, I think from 1920 to 2021, we, near, we more than doubled our use of reserves. And for a while, we were hovering on the just. I would say around a million dollars or north of a million dollars. And as a result of that catch-up aid from last year, we were able to hit the, hit the reset button in the sense that year over year, we actually used five, half a million dollars less in reserves in order to better prepare ourselves for when times get really tough. Well, guess what? We're hearing over the next two to three years, times are going to get really tough. So we have, we have positioned ourselves to be in a good um, a good spot to at least try to weather some storms. Once again, we don't know what the outlook's going to be a year from now. We at least know that we're in a decent spot to weather that storm. So if we can maintain that those use of reserves, once again, not increase, not decrease necessarily, but just maintain how much we're using, when times get really tough, we can look to further draw from our reserves to offset our revenue year over year. Our bus purchase reserves and our capital reserves. The first thing I'd like to point out, and once again, I'm going to use my, my cursor over here, if I could highlight our two different capital reserves. We've got a 2020 capital reserve and we've got a 2023 capital reserve. Those two reserves combined currently have $6.144 million. Now, that is a very healthy amount considering we are having very preliminary, pre preliminary discussions, excuse me, about going out for a capital project vote that Mr. Ganster is going to talk about in uh, further detail. And once again, we're going to have many discussions over the coming months. But that $6.144 million is going to help us offset any local share that this capital project might have on the community. So, so potentially, no increase in taxes. The bus purchase reserve that's currently has a balance of $1.925 million. Unfortunately, the bus companies are backed up on delivering their orders. We ordered five buses last year. They've only delivered one of them. We still have four waiting. So once those four buses come in, that 1.925 million is going to be more in the vicinity of 1.4 or 1.3 million. There's just one problem. Since the start of this reserve, the total funding, the total amount of money we have added to this reserve is 2.823 million which means we've got roughly about 177,000 more we can add from year-end savings 
But once we do that, that reserve is fully funded. So by law, you can't add a dollar more once it's fully funded. So one of the things we're going to talk about is the possibility of the community voting on opening another reserve. And what is that? That's, a, that's essentially a savings account. It starts at zero dollars, but what we're saying is it, it, needs, it can have a max allocation of about five million dollars. The previous bus purchase reserve had a max allocation of three million. This one's five million. Why, why are we increasing it by two million? Well, the cost of a diesel bus went from about 120,000 to 150,000 to 170,000. That's a diesel bus within the last two to three years. Now, if we are ever mandated to change the nature of our fleet from diesel to electric, the current cost of an electric bus is $400,000. That's, that's today's numbers. And once again, that could be subject to increase. So hence, we want to increase the size of our reserve so that we can put in any year-end savings into those reserves and build them up so that we can continue to maintain our fleet and upgrade our fleet as our old buses start to wear, st start to wear out or reach their useful life, which in most cases, for many districts, by 10 years, those buses have little to no trade-in value. In a perfect world, you want to have a bus on a five-year replacement cycle so that it doesn't start to break down too much and so that it still has a, a healthy resale value or a trade-in value when you go to purchase a new bus. So that's a snapshot of the governor's budget. That's a snapshot of where our reserves have been, how we've been able to hit the reset button, and how we can also look at our reserves for future planning for this district, whether it is purchasing buses or whether it's capital improvements on our, on our district. So our budget goals, um, the first three are very similar. Actually, no, they're identical to the budget goals from last, uh, last year. Being responsible to our taxpayers while meeting the needs of students. Protecting long-term availability of district reserves. And then finally, continuing to save money year at the end of each year so we can fund these reserves so we can always plan for the future. The fourth one is what's new to this year, planning for a negative budget outlook in 25-26. So I, I just want to stop right here, and I want to see if any members of the board have any questions, any comments, as we have those four budget goals before I move forward in the presentation. I appreciate your explanation. It helps understand. Yeah. <laughs> it helps us Thank understand you. everything. Um, as I as I shared with my colleagues on Friday, when when the business officials met on Friday, I said, you know, nobody should take credit if you've got an increase in foundation aid. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, Phelps, Clifton Springs, I feel like we dodged a bullet, because 45 percent of districts around us are getting lesser foundation aid. So we dodged a bullet for one year, but that doesn't mean we're immune to this bullet. It might be coming down the line, it might be next year, it might be the year after that. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So as long as we start thinking about how we can be fiscally conservative, going from year to year, and how we manage our money, I think we'll be in decent shape. I have a question, Carl. Yes, Mike. Um, is, it, is it possible to have some kind of um, reserve for the infrastructure that comes with the purchase of electric buses? Potentially. So as and, I... And the infrastructure I'm talking about is things that, that we've discussed in terms of fire safety, in, you know, having to redo the asphalt, right. the wear of the tires, all that kind of stuff. So, so, Mike, you bring up a very good point. So the bus purchase reserve is going to help us purchase buses. But where, do we, where can we purchase a charger? How are we going to bury the conduit under the ground if we have to? How are we going to upgrade our fire suppression system? Those are the things that are actually going to come out of the capital reserve. So once again, we don't just want to fund one reserve. We want to fund both reserves because the day we're mandated to electrify our fleet um, or the electrification of our fleet, we're going to have to start thinking about a capital project. We had one of our neighboring districts get a grant, um, a federal grant, I believe, to purchase two buses. Along the way, they very quickly realized that that money wasn't even, was barely enough, if not just a little short, of actually purchasing those two buses. Then they had to go out for a community vote to do a capital project to purchase the chargers, to purchase the electric infrastructure, and to do all the other things just for those buses. So there's a strong likelihood when that day comes, we're going to be reaching to our capital reserves to do a project. Gotcha. To better support our fleet. Yep. Great question, though. So 
next couple of slides are going to talk, are, are, we're just going to transition and talk about our tax levy. So this is the calculation that we have to do year over year. By March 1st, we have to submit it to the Comptroller's Office, and every school district has to talk about what is their maximum amount they can levy in taxes with just a regular majority vote. That's 50 percent voter majority. Based on, it starts with last year's tax levy. It starts with a calculation where you have to factor, factor in what's called payments in lieu of taxes. Um, the Office of Real Property Tax Services also sets what's called a growth factor for every school district or every community across the state. They take into account, there's another part of the formula is um, the tax levy growth factor, which is the lesser of two. It could be CPI or 2%. Well, for the last several years, that's been 2% because that's the lower of the two numbers. And then finally, if any school district goes out under their tax levy, they get to carry over some funds, a certain percentage, year over year. So based on those calculations, our tax levy for the 24-25 school year will be $16,200,609, or an increase of $690,851, uh, $690, or 4.73%. So once again, that means we can increase our tax levy by 4.73%, seeking a voter, just a regular majority, not a supermajority. But this is a historical visual of the tax levy history at Midlakes. The red line represents every year's tax levy limit. The blue line represents where Phelps Clifton Springs has actually gone out in terms of their tax levy. Just a couple observations, and I just say this every year. Based on the data over a 10-year stretch, Phelps Clifton Springs has only ever gone out at the levy limit twice, that being 2012-2013, where the red and the blue line meet, and 2014-2015. Every other year, this district has gone out underneath the tax levy or less than the tax levy because that's what they've determined was what's needed to close the budget and be responsible to the community. Once again, we've got a levy limit of 4.73 percent, and over the next couple presentations, we're going to close that number in, we're going to look at some specific numbers in various departments, and we're going to try to land on the number where we need to be to close our budget and once again be responsible to our taxpayers. The bus purchases. So how many, bus, how many bus purchases do we need for this year? Um, we, there's six buses and one Suburban that we need to purchase. These six buses are a direct replacement to buses that are aging out. Um, probably the most important one I'm going to highlight is the wheelchair accessible bus because we have two wheelchair buses currently in our fleet and we have students um, that require wheelchair transportation. If one of those buses is even broken or in the garage, it puts a huge strain on our fleet. And so we need to update one of those buses um, as soon as possible, and that needs to be part of, our, um, part of our bus purchase. The other five of them, once again, are just based on the fact that older buses are aging out, and we need to update them to avoid major repairs and major breakdowns. The Suburban, the purpose of the Suburban, we have a variety of students that go on, whether it's out of district, uh, that are in out of district placements or in special education placements across the Wayne Finger Lakes region, but those are a very small amount of stu students. We currently have a Suburban and two large, I'm going to use the phrase conversion vans, but those conversion vans are significantly old and um, the companies that used to make those, like Chevy, aren't, making, aren't offering those vans to school districts anymore. So we're looking to trade in one of those vans, purchase the Suburban, so we can continue to drive our students to out-of-district placements. The beautiful part about our bus purchases is when we invest in our buses, Phelps Clifton Springs, based on um, several factors, gets 90% transportation aid, which is the highest number any school district can get across New York State. Any bus purchases are amortized over five years. So anytime we purchase a bus over the five years after that, we're getting 90% of the money back. And so in transportation, all said and done, it actually costs the district over five years about a tenth of what we spend to actually purchase that, those buses. So the propositions we have, the five propositions, is to adopt the annual budget for the school district for 24-25 
to elect three members of the Board of Education. I, I wanted to add more detail, but I think based on election results, that may be a little complicated, but based on uh, you know whose seat goes up and how the results uh, go. So I'm just gonna put a very broad statement to elect three members to the Board of Education. We talked about the bus purchases, the seven purchases, six are actual buses, one a Suburban, in that amount of a million, 73,880. Um, to create a new reserve, once again, our old reserve is almost fully funded. We can fund about another 177000 before it's fully funded. So we need to create a new reserve to plan for the future or a new savings account. And then finally, the separate proposition for the Phelps Community Library and the Clifton Springs Library. So next steps, we're just going to make sure with, with the help of BOCES, we're going to finalize our tax levy limit and submit it to the comptroller by, by March 1st. We're going to, talk, we're going to identify all the, the programmatic and operational adjustments, whether it's looking at operations and maintenance through facilities and planning or transportation or looking at curriculum and instruction. And you're going to see many of those presented in, in uh, next month's budget presentation and uh, what included inclusive with, of debt service, um, the, employees' retirement system rates, teachers' retirement system rates, actual dollars of what it means for health care increases based on the Finger Lakes Area School Health Plan. So that's what you can anticipate to see in next month's budget presentation. So that covers just about everything. I'm going to stop and see one more time if you folks have any questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And on to Margo and Jeff for MTSS and 912 Academic Indicators. So thanks for having Margo and I here this evening. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have the great fortune of having to do less of the talking. Um, but uh, the great leader of some of our MTSS work um, is going to do much more of the talking. Um, I will share with you, you know, before we, before we dive in, um, as I was reflecting uh, about this evening's presentation, uh, I was thinking about when uh, Margot came to this district in summer of 2023, which I would argue is not the big summer of 2022, excuse me, thank you, Mr. Dubash. Summer 2022, <laughs> about a year and a half ago, I should have said, how's that? Um, you know, there was work being done around MTSS structures, but I would say lots of focus work really began with this role coming to the district. And as you see this presentation tonight, I don't want you to lose sight of we're a year and a half in of building this very robust system. Um, and it's always a work in progress. Um, I, I don't think you'll ever hear anyone um, in these roles say, we're there, we've got it all, there's nothing left to do. Um, it's always an evolving process. So. When we think about those tiered systems of support, right, MTSS stands for multi-level um, multi um, tiered systems of support. Um, no tier lives in isolation. Right, uh, They have to work really in concert with each other. So students who might be accessing supports at a Tier 3 level also need supports at a Tier 2 level. And students accessing supports at a Tier level also need really good Tier 1. Um, and when we frame that out, we think about Tier 1 being what every student gets, right? Um, whether that's academic, whether that's SEL. Tier two, maybe a smaller group of students. Um, the goal is around 15% of your student population are accessing tier two support. So then tier three is really that three to 5% of the population um, accessing tier two and three supports. <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind is um, making sure, as I said, that everything's working in concert, right? Are these things all connected? Are districts doing a lot of great work how are all these things being connected? And when we look at the MTSS world, we really focus on a, a tool called the Tiered Fidelity Inventory, 